Right, well, if you could turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to be starting the very last chapter of this book, so we should be finishing it out sometime in the next couple of weeks. And I think it's important before we get into tonight's text that we understand the context of what John has been saying all throughout this letter. Because he keeps repeating very similar ideas all throughout this letter. And that's really what it is. I think it's kind of interesting that we can take so long to go through this. And yet for him, this would have been something that most people would have sat in one sitting and read through this whole thing. Would have likely just been a handful of pages. But it's important that we understand what John's intention is in writing this letter. Because the thing that he wants to accomplish is he wants Christians, these Christians in particular to have assurance of their salvation, that they can know that they know. And not only that, in the process, he's exposing false teaching as well as false belief. The things that are actually not true that this group of false teachers that separated from them have been saying. And they want to know, well, wait a minute, I thought this was the truth. And so John is encouraging them and giving them that assurance throughout this letter. Now, this chapter's place in the book, this is what it's doing, is that he's essentially starting to land the plane that is this letter. He's starting to wrap up all of the ideas that he's been talking about. And so John would have us know what faith, real faith, looks like. Because it's not whatever we make it. There's an objective reality based in faith. And so our assurance comes from correctly understanding what that faith is, what it's based in, and what it looks like. And that's what John is going to be talking about here in these five verses that we're going to go over tonight. So if you would, 1 John chapter 5. He says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. And by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God? Father, we just thank you for this time that we can be in your word. Just pray that you would speak to us. Lord, that you would speak through me, that I would simply be your mouthpiece this evening. Uh, Lord, that you would just put your message, Lord, in my mouth, Lord, to share tonight. And so I just pray that you would be with us, that you would open up our ears and our hearts and our minds to receive and to understand, Lord, what you would speak to us tonight. We love you. We thank you. And it's in your name we pray all of these things. Amen. So notice, he starts out, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. So whenever we talk about faith, we're saved by faith, right? We possess eternal life by faith, right? Constantly throughout the Gospels, you see that we have received that faith by grace. And what do we do? We simply believe, right? And that's exactly what he's talking about here. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. So he goes straight to the object of what our faith is. The central truth of what true saving faith looks like. And this is very important because there's a lot of people that have varying understandings of what faith is. They might think that it's sincere belief, but it's not just sincere belief. Simply believing in God, well, that's not really faith either. James actually talked about that, didn't he? He said that even the demons believe and tremble. It doesn't mean that they're saved. They know that God exists. It's not just an abstract idea. I'm sure you've probably bumped into these people where they say, oh, I wish I had faith. And it doesn't really matter what the content of the faith is. They just want something to believe in. Just to to simply validate, give meaning to their lives, to their existence. But that's not sufficient. It's not defined by human feelings and emotions. It's not defined by people at all. It's not a subjective experience of simply believing in something, there is something attached to faith that makes it what it is. And John tells us exactly what that is. This objective reality, this truth that faith 
is grounded in, a very specific and particular truth. It's a sincere belief that Jesus is the Christ. If you want to know what kind of faith saves, that's the faith that saves. The faith that believes that Jesus is everything that he claimed to be. Romans, 8, or Romans 10, 9 through 10, Paul says this, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. It's a sincere belief that Jesus is the Son of God, that he's the Messiah, that he's God in human flesh, that he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's what real faith is. And Christ is the object of that faith. And so what he's saying is that in order to be born of God, to be able to truly know God, you have to believe that truth. It's non-negotiable. If you do not accept that truth, then it's not real faith, is what John is saying. And so that's where faith begins. If you want to know where true faith comes from, where it starts, it's that truth. And then notice, he says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, is a child of God, is someone who loves the Father, someone who has relationship with the Father, someone who has been saved from the righteous wrath of God, somebody who has eternal life, someone who has salvation. Do you see where he's going with this? He's establishing a very important truth. He's saying that if you want eternal life, a lot of people say that they want heaven, but what he's saying is, is that in order to have heaven, eternal salvation, all of that is dependent upon the fact that you also have Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, you have nothing else. And so this is the implication. You must believe that Jesus is the Christ to be a Christian. You can't be a Christian and not believe that Jesus is everything that he claimed to be. If one does not believe that he is Lord and Savior, he or she cannot be born of God. Or rather, that person cannot be called a Christian. It's a very central truth. It's a non-negotiable. It's a, an essential doctrine, as we would call it. You have to believe it. Otherwise, you don't get anything else. He has to be the Christ. This means you have to believe in his deity, the fact that he's God. You have to believe in the power of his death that takes away sin and averts the wrath of God. You have to believe that the full measure of God's love was expressed on the cross. That eternal life is only experienced by faith in Christ, which is through God's grace. So he establishes what the core truth about faith is. And this is very important because if we're going to have any assurance, we have to understand what this faith is based in. And so that's where he's going. Now notice what he says next. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. So what he's now saying is that you cannot love God without loving his children also. This echoes exactly what John heard Jesus say back in his gospel. John 13, 34 through 35. And a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, what's really interesting, I want you to understand what he's doing. He's not giving a moral standard to be observed. John is not giving his audience something to do, saying that, oh, you need to love people. That's not what's happening here. He's actually describing a natural outcome of true, legitimate, saving faith. He's saying that if you are truly born of God, if you truly know God, you will love other believers. Do you see the difference between that? And just having a moral command. One is saying, well, you should probably do this if you're a believer. The other one's saying that if you have true faith, you will do it. And if you don't do it, you actually don't know him. That's the difference between those two statements. And so he's saying that if we truly know him, if we have born, been born of God, we will also love other people that have been born of God. It's not an optional truth for the child of God. And so he's declaring a truth that's a characteristic of true saving faith, of true Christianity. Loving other believers is a sign that you truly know him. Now notice what he's doing. He's connecting love and faith together. He's intermingling those two things. 
They're not necessarily the same thing, but they're connected. You can't have love without faith, and you can't have faith without love. They're interconnected. You cannot have one without the other. You cannot love the family of God without faith. You cannot have faith without also loving the family of God. And so to have one is to have the other also. And so what he has just done is he has given an objective proof of faith. You realize what he's done? He's saying that it's actually not possible without faith. Now, do you realize why this is encouraging? Because that means if you love the family of God, then that means you know him. Because it's not something that is possible otherwise. See, the world does not love the family of God. In fact, Jesus said that because the world has hated me, it will hate you also. If you know Christ, the world's going to hate you. But if you love other believers, that's a sign that Christ is in you. Because it's not possible for the world to love Christ. Truly, to love Christians in the way that he describes. And so by this, we know that we love the children of God. So now here's what's really interesting, though, is that he is now going to describe what it means to love the children of God. Because that's also important, right? A lot of people try to define love for themselves. And so he is going to explain that. So by this, we know. How can we be sure that we truly love the children of God? That we love other believers, first of all, by loving God. Isn't that what he said? The greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So in order to correctly love others, we have to love God first. But then at the same time, what does it mean to love God? What standard does God use for love? Because I said before, love is defined in many different ways. Sometimes it's, Defined as simply just romantic attraction. It's that warm, fuzzy feeling when you're around somebody you like a whole lot. You know, you get the feeling of butterflies in your stomach, right? Maybe it's care and concern for somebody. Now, none of those things are necessarily bad. But that's not necessarily what John's talking about. In fact, there is a very particular love that he is talking about here. The love that's tied together with faith, it's a very specific kind of love. Notice what he says. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. So now what he's done is not only has he interlocked love and faith, but he's now just added obedience into the mix. So love, faith, and obedience are all intermingled. They're all meshed together. You can't separate any one from the other. And so when we obey his commands. That's how we can know when we love God. That's how we can actually know that we are being loving towards other Christians is are we doing what God is telling us to do? See, obedience is the way that we express love towards God. If we love him, then we'll do what he says, right? We'll desire to please him by doing what he asks. And likewise, we love other believers when we obey his commands. Because to be loving is actually to carry out what God says. Because didn't John say it? God is love. And so everything that he does naturally is loving. And that's even the hard stuff. His wrath against sin is actually because of his love. Why? Because sin is destructive. I mean, think about it. If somebody was trying to kill your family, would you not want to execute justice against them? Wouldn't that actually be an act of love to protect the people that you care about? And so everything that God does stems from his character of love. And so by doing what he says, we will do what is loving to other believers. Think about what God commands us to do. Self-sacrifice, kindness, gentleness, humility, being truthful and honest, being selfless, being self-controlled, not having selfish ambition, but esteeming others higher than we esteem ourselves. It sounds an awful lot like love to me that's exactly what it is. So God is love, and so all of his commands are based in it. Nothing he does, says, or nothing that he is could be anything less than loving. And so when we carry out his commands, we are going to grow in love as his children. So for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. 
So this is the love of God. Now, once again, he is just interconnected love and obedience. You can't have one without the other. So if you love God and his people, then you will be obedient. And likewise, if you are truly obedient, then you will love God and his people. They're intermingled. You can't separate the two. You cannot love God and not be obedient because you've seen some of those people, right? They claim to be Christians. They claim to be to, to love the Lord. But then you look at their lives and you don't see any evidence that they even care what the Lord thinks. They just continue to do what they want to do. They continue to engage in sin. They don't really have any concern for what God says in his word. But they don't really seem to have any desire to actually please him. It's almost like they're just trying to escape judgment, but that's really it. You cannot be obedient and not love God. The same thing is also true. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so we really can't truly do what he asks without also knowing him. Nor would we really want to, right? Isn't that the way that our flesh works? It's opposed to God. And so naturally, we want to sin and to do those things that displease God, unless God does something within us. And so no claim can be made to love God and his people without also being obedient. It isn't possible. Love is what God says it is. I think this is really important. This is something for us to understand, that if we're truly to be loving, we also have to be obedient to what God says. Because we're, once again, prone to defining love for ourselves. And yet love is what God says it is, not what we say it is. That's why it's never loving to lie, and yet some people would think that it is. That it's never love to have sex with somebody that you're not married to. It's not love. It's lust. They're not the same thing. Homosexuality is not an issue of love, but of sin. Just because we think something is loving doesn't mean that it is. And that's why it's really important that we know what God says. Because if God is love, then that means he defines what love is. And if he says that something is sin, and we want to call it love, then that means we are wrong. Period. End of discussion. Because God created us. God knows what's good for us. And so if he's telling us that these things are sinful and that they're destructive, then he means it. Now, once again, notice, John is not giving a moral obligation to follow. As I said before, with being loving, the same thing is true with being obedient. It's something that is actually characteristic of people that know him, that love him. He's not just giving us rules to follow. Remember again what Jesus said in Matthew 12, 46 46 through 50. He said, while he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak with him. But he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So Jesus also connected all of these things together. He's saying that if you truly have faith, if you truly know him, if you are a part of the family of God, it is natural to want to do what God says, that you will do what God says. Now, that doesn't mean that you are going to do it perfectly, but that you will have a desire to please him. And so what John is doing is he's telling us what Christians are really like. He's essentially separating believers from unbelievers. Notice he's not separating the, the, I guess, the triumphant, you know, super spiritual Christians from the kind of sort of carnal Christians who don't really do what God asks, but they're still saved. No, he is making a clear defined line between those who know God and those who don't. And what he's saying is, is that if you are obedient, if you love the family of God, if you love Jesus, if you believe that he's the Christ, if you love other believers, if you do what he says, if you like to do what he says, then you know him. But if you can't say that about your life, then you don't. That's what he's saying. And here's why. Because when we come to know the Lord, God does something in our lives. God does something in us. He supernaturally transforms people when they come to know him. We call this regeneration. This is where the Lord takes our our heart of stone, as the Bible refers to it, and he gives us that heart of flesh. He takes our sinfulness, he forgives us, and he begins to transform us into something new. That when the Bible says we are a new creation in Christ, it's not just kind of a turn of phrase. We are literally something new because God has done something in us. He has transformed our nature. nature. He has taken the spiritual blinders off to where we can see ourselves as we really are. 
that we can see this world for what it really is. That we can actually understand the truth of God's word. And so God gives believers a desire to please him. God gives believers a desire to be loving towards him and his people. And then notice what he says next. And his commandments are not burdensome. They're not a downer. Now, this does not mean that it's always easy to do what God says. This does not mean that it doesn't take sacrifice at times. This does not mean that it's not a struggle to do at times. This does not mean that we will always be obedient as his children. Because we still have that inbuilt bias of our sin nature. It still lurks within us. Paul talked about that. He said we have you know, essentially two natures. We have the nature of the flesh and we have the nature of the spirit. And those two things war against each other until the day that we die. But what this does mean is that the regenerated heart, the heart that truly knows Christ, that truly knows God, has a desire to do what he says. That he or she is happy to do what he says. Even if it's difficult, even if it takes effort, we naturally want to do the things that please God. And we will also be unhappy to remain in a state of sin. Sin is not something that we will take pleasure in. It's something that when it happens, it's going to burden us. That will go, man, Lord, I'm sorry. I can't believe I did that. Sorry I thought that thing. Sorry I did that thing. Sorry that I said that thing. The spirit within us will actually bother us about that. Why? Because we don't actually really want to sin anymore. There's still our sin nature that does, but then there's this new nature of Christ within us that doesn't want to. Not only that, the person who loves Christ, who knows Christ, will also see that God's commands are actually fulfilling and freeing. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. Remember what Jesus said? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, the believer recognizes that a life of sin, though pleasing for a season, is actually very hard. That it's full of heartache and suffering. That it is not something that is actually pleasing in the long term, but does great damage. The Christian recognizes that his commands are actually for their good. That they realize that, their reward and bless, that there's reward and blessing in keeping him. And that God actually gives us the strength to do what he commands. If we'll trust him. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Now notice what he says next. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So those who know Christ, those who are walking in obedience, loving other believers, loving God, have overcome the world. That they have victory over sin. That Satan's hold on them is broken forever. They're free to love God. That they're free from their selfish desires. They're free from needing to please themselves at all times. That they're actually freed to please God. That they're free to do what he says. That they're actually free to love other people because they're not enslaved to their selfish nature. They can actually give of themselves without actually expecting anything in return. That they can actually just do good for the sake of doing good. There doesn't actually need to be a reason for doing it apart from the fact that they simply love somebody else. Have you ever pondered that? That Jesus loved us in such a way That if you really think about it, you start to ask, well, well, why did Jesus do what he did? Why does God love us? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Because think about it. God gets nothing. He needs nothing. So why? Simply because it's in his nature to do so. That's mind-boggling for us. Because most of the time when we think about stuff, we tend to go, I need to have a reason to do this. And God says, I'm going to do this simply because it's who I am. Because it's in my nature to love. And likewise, God gives us that nature. 
doesn't always work out that way because we still have that sin nature that we wrestle with, but we can actually love simply for the sake of it. Not only that, believers have overcome the wickedness of this world. Does anybody else get tired of seeing things in the news where it's like these people got blown up, these people are shooting at each other, this riot happened, this person got shot? Does anybody else get tired of seeing all that? I do. Kind of just wonder, it's like, couldn't the world just get along? Couldn't we just be nice to each other? It can be really sad and difficult to see that at times. And yet, that world's going to be overcome. And in fact, it's already been overcome. That we already had victory in Christ. Paul talks about this in Romans 8, 35 through 39. And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we're being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to the slaughter. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. One day, death, sin, violence, anger, hatred, it's all going to be done. It's just a matter of time. And in fact, if you want to look at it this way, Jesus started the countdown clock on the cross. We have victory over the wickedness of this world. Evil does not win in the end. Disease and famine do not win in the end. Violence and hatred do not win in the end. Now notice here what he says. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Now the emphasis is on what Christ did. Not on the fact that we believed, but on what Christ did. Because that victory that we have comes from Christ. It wasn't achieved by our believing. Here's why this is important. Because that means Christ did it, not us. If it's achieved by our believing, then we were essentially the one who brought in the victory. But the reality is, Christ brought about the victory. And though it's our faith, though it Christ did it we still do need to believe we still need to personally believe that message and it's the new birth from God that conquers though it's not us it's the new birth that God gives us that conquers God is the conqueror over sin and death not us we're simply recipients of that victory by grace through faith and then he says and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. It has to be our faith. That victory has to be grabbed hold of. First of all, by us as believers. Now, we first do this when we express faith in Christ, right? That we have that victory. From the moment that we are saved, from the moment that the Lord regenerates us, makes us new, we have that victory. But we still have to walk in it. And that victory is exercised in faith. By what? love and obedience it, when we walk in love and obedience we're also walking in victory now why is that because it's actually our faith that's the victory do you realize the fact that we can believe at all is a miracle that's actually something that god has done in us that he removed the blinders that we can know him that is something that god does in us The fact that we can see ourselves as we truly are. The fact that we can understand God's truth. That's victory in and of itself. Why? Think about what Paul said. That the world suppresses the truth and unrighteousness. They don't want to believe it. They don't want to see it. They can't see it. And yet we can because of what God has done in us but we still have to believe God and to do what he says if we're to experience that victory in Christ. And this is actually much of the Christian life. I think oftentimes people oversimplify it, where it's like, oh, you know, I came to know Christ and the struggle's over. But the reality is, as much of the Christian life is growing in faith and there much of the Christian life is growing in love and obedience. They're not things that happen instantaneously, but it's something that the Lord produces within us. Now, verse 5. 
and we'll begin to wrap up. But notice what he does with this last verse. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So he now wraps this full circle. It goes back to the very first statement that he made. Remember? Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So he's now just brought this whole thing full circle. He's wrapped up faith, love, obedience, victory. They're all a package deal. They're all tied up together. It's all been knotted in such a way that you can't separate one from the other. The one who overcomes is the one who believes that Jesus is the Christ. Victory is obtained by faith. Victory is experienced in love and obedience. And so love and obedience are a result of faith in Christ. Faith, obedience, love, victory, they're all tied together. Without true faith in Christ, there can be no love, there can be no obedience, and there can be no victory. Love for God and his people is a result of regeneration. Obedience and a love for God's commands is a result of regeneration. Victory over the world and sin is a result of regeneration. That God has actually transformed us, that he has made us New. And so unless Christ does something in us, we can't actually possess any of those things. Now here's why this is important. This is why John has spent some time to explain this. Because he's also just given us the ability to have assurance. Here's why. If love is impossible apart from Christ, if obedience is impossible apart from Christ, if victory is impossible, true victory, true obedience, true love, if all of those things are impossible apart from Christ, then how is it that some people can do it and others cannot? Because they are in Christ. Because they actually know him. So that is why we can actually have assurance Because apart from Christ, all of those things are impossible. So what he said is that if you love to do what God commands, guess what? You know him. If you love other believers on top of that, you know him. If you believe that he is the son of God, you love him. If you have victory, that you're capable of seeing the truths of scripture, if you are capable of seeing your own sinful nature and believing in Christ, you know him. He's just given us an objective standard for this. Because he's saying that if you don't do those things, here's the scary part. If you don't do those things, but you name the name of Christ, what he's actually saying is you don't know him. Because if you truly know him, you walk in obedience. You walk in love towards other people in the family of God. You walk in victory. Because he wants us to have assurance. And so he lays out these objective truths of faith. He's saying if you have faith, you have these things also. He's saying you can't separate them. But that's a good thing for us because that means we can look at these things. Because I don't know about you guys. I've had doubts at time in my own, at times in my own life. And I'm sure almost everybody else has. Where they're just looking at their life and you're going like, man, do I really know him? Like sometimes you just think about the decisions you've made, the things that you've said, the things that you've done. And you just go like, could I really truly know him? Because the reality is we all know how messed up we are. We all know the dumb things that we do every single day that nobody knows about. And what he's just said is that you can know that you know him. Look at your life. Do you love other Christians? Do you love Jesus? Do you obey God's commands? Do you have a desire to please him at all? Are you bothered by sin? What John's saying is that you know him. And so place your hope in Christ. That's where it all starts, right? That's where John started this. Unless you know Christ, none of these other things are possible. In fact, All of those things are impossible, but the more important thing is that you need to know him so you can be transformed, so that you can experience, fully experience the love of God. So the assurance of a right standing before God begins with faith. Do you believe that Jesus is the son of God who takes away your sin and makes you right before God? Victory over sin is not grabbed hold of by works. Sad thing is so many people try to become right with God by what they do. They try to enter into the kingdom of heaven because they've done enough good works. There are not enough good works for you to do. It's only done by faith. Works cannot save us. And they can't bring us any hope of assurance. Only the grace of God found in the person and work of Jesus Christ can do that. That can give us assurance that we are right before God. 
Secondly, test your faith. See if it's real. Do you love the family of God? Do you care about their well-being? Do you care about their right standing before God? Do you sacrifice yourself for their good? A genuine faith is shown by a genuine love for the family of God. Test your love. Is your love grounded in obedience to him? Is your desire to please him? Is your life characterized by desiring to keep God's commands? Genuine love is proven by genuine obedience. And then lastly, if all of these things are true, walk in victory. Don't walk in defeat. Walk in victory. We can have victory over the world. We can have victory over sin and it's experienced through faith that works. It's experienced through loving the family of God. It's experienced in doing what God has commanded us to do. A faith that loves God and his people. A faith that obeys God's commands. Victory is obtained through a genuine life or a genuine faith in Christ. And it's experienced when we love the family of God and act in obedience. So we have to apply that victory daily. It's not something that we just kind of get when we're first a believer, right? You give your faith in your, you put your faith in Christ, you give yourself over to him. It's not just something that we automatically obtain. It's still something that has to be worked out in our daily experience. Part of that victory is that we can actually walk in obedience. Paul talks about this. For our call is Romans 6, where he says, we are actually no longer a slave of sin, but a slave of righteousness. That we can actually do what God asks of us. Because apart from him, we can't actually do it. And so part of that victory is actually being able to walk in obedience, to being able to walk in righteousness, to actually start being his image bearer, to be the person that he's called us to be. And so I challenge you, walk in that victory. Don't just go through your life defeated all the time because the reality is if you're not loving other believers, if you're not walking in obedience, one, you may not know him, but the other thing is if you do know him, you're not going to be walking in victory. If you want to be a more victorious Christian, walk in love and walk in obedience and know that you can know that you know him. You can know that you know God. Look at your life. Do you walk in obedience? Do you walk in love? Do you desire to please God? Do you believe that he is the son of God? Because if you do, you know him. The scary thing is, though, if you don't, you don't know him, but you can And so place your hope and trust and your faith in Christ. Father, we just thank you for this evening. Thank you for all that you've done in us. Lord, thank you that we have victory in you. Lord, thank you that that victory is experienced in love and obedience. And I just pray for everyone in here, Lord, that maybe had doubts when they walked in, that they would know whether they are right with you or not. Lord, if they are right with you, would you give them that victory? Give them that assurance as they walk in obedience to you and your commands. And Lord, if they don't know you, would they confess with their mouth that you are Lord of all, Lord, that you are the one who redeemed them, that they can have right standing before God because of what you did, not anything that they did. And then, Lord, would they also walk in love, in obedience, and victory. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Be with us as we go into small groups. And it's in your name we pray all of these things. Amen.